good evening from the UK, or maybe good afternoon in the United States. Uh, my name is Mark Langworthy, I'm the creative director over at Red Scar Publishing. We are here tonight for episode 5 of Dead Man's Rust. Apologies for the slight delay in getting started, we've had some te technical difficulties. Um, Twitchy! <laughs> the Red Scar technical gremlin. Um. Back to playing as well again. Yep. Uh, but we are now live, um, and as you can see, we are a few players light tonight. Um, <laughs> Only a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, due to various reasons, it will just be myself and Alex tonight. Uh, but we should be back with a full team next week to continue the adventures. Um, I'll hand over to Alex to say hello. Hi, I'm Alex. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at LibertyOtter, where I talk about game design and all the wonderful games that people are doing that more people should play or just have on their shelves, because as we all know, if it's on your shelf and it looks pretty, that's as good as playing it. Um, <laughs> and I will be playing Nevin, um, the quintessential... I say quintessential. I'm not sure what Nevin is. Nevin's, uh, uh, Nevin's becoming a noun of you've pulled a Nevin. What's that? You've had zero sense of humour and just teeth grinding galore who is a hollow legionnaire who had all of the um sarcasm and sense of humor beaten out of him when he was forced into a new suit of armor after he died um uh, or he is dying or he is, I don't, the rest of the party confused never on whether or not he's already dead or if he's dying but it's fine they're not here so i won't have an existential crisis maybe i don't know I'm giving, mark's smiling that's never a good <laughs> the gm's giggling when i mentioned the existential dread and um, I'm currently a second level paladin, uh, so I'm close to almost having a class. And yeah, that's everything, I think. Yeah, so uh, I think, I don't know if I mentioned Alex, but you can find Alex um, using online at Libiot, Liberty Otter over on Twitter, uh, and myself at KP Langers over on Twitter also. Um, this week we're missing Liz, um, who is at Angry Hamster publishing um she is usually playing vivin who um is kind of the thorn in my side study, I guess. Uh, both failing from the gleaming spire she's yep. playing a um a sap monk mm -hmm. uh we also have paco who's unfortunately again uh, missing tonight um who's playing a uh, manticora ranger um, she's kind of trying to, or they're, they're trying to find their way in the world at the moment. Um, and Terry also, who is playing a Drendali bard, who has left dear Drendal under a cloud, shall we say. <laughs> and as backstories slowly build, um, with Alex and myself on a solo session tonight, we've kind of decided to delve into a little bit of Nevin's backstory. Um, so it's going to be a shorter game tonight and more kind of more narrative based than um, than anything else, which I think is part of the course for our sessions lately, anyway. Um, <laughs> we almost had a combat once, almost. <laughs> well, to be honest, it could have gone either way last week, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but you all did a very uh, very beautiful thing in in laying helping lay the uh, the league to rest. Yeah. But we're off the boat now. There's no just floating back down the river. <laughs> just like, we are in trouble. We are in danger. <laughs> so previous sessions, they began in a, um, a town called Leone, which is kind of the Manticora's um, main hub of civilization. Uh, lots of Manticora tribes still roam the plains, but they have built a uh, kind of permanent, almost semi-permanent abode in um, Leone. Um, the group gathered on the Night of Bards, which is a, a coming together of um, storytellers and entertainers from across Galspad and beyond to um, spend a good few nights in passing tales and um, keeping old traditions alive and, and building new traditions. Um, they met a uh, an elderly dwarf called Drodoki Bronzebeard. Um, much <laughs> merriment and um, strange tales ensued from there on out. But ultimately, Doroki, go on, Alex, you can take it. I'm just remembering the boulder incident that's just giving me just like, oh, we did that. Oh. <laughs> I think to be fair, Vivian did that. 
It's my one consolation. You laid the challenge. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Jodoki kind of entreated the group to take him home to uh, the Broadreach Horizon, which is which is uh, some distance south of Leone. Uh, on the other side of a huge forest which is inhabited by the wood elves. Um, so the group generously agreed um, and in amongst all of the um, agreement and merriment uh, Nevin challenged Vivin with the uh, task of transporting a boulder which Vivin I seem to recall it was if you're that attached to the boulder you can bring it with you or you can apologise <laughs> and I think it says as much about Niven as it does about Nevin of, well, I'm going to go and find a dwarven runesmith to move the boulder. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, it was... I'm sure the videos are, are online. Um, it was a, a rather humorous hour or so, I guess, trying to get that boulder free from the ground. Humorous, um, calamitous. And, and the boulder <laughs> literally travelled with the party and, and came into play later on. The group eventually left um, after chartering a ship and travelled a creek, um, heading south into the forest, the uh, the Ganges forest, uh, which is a huge swath of uh, woodland on the continent of Gelspad. Um, they deftly dodged an encounter with some zombies. Um, sadly, laid to rest a boar that. Andrea had met earlier during the day. I'm gonna go and find dinner. Oh, I oh look at that that eyes and look at those little cheeks and do do. <laughs> and then Nevin rage intensifies. I think Nevin's gonna turn out to be a barbarian by the end of the campaign. <laughs> just <laughs> just a splash. <laughs> yeah, just a, just a bit. Um, and then the kind of the pre the. Moving on the journey, um, a day or two later, they woke up to uh, to find themselves smothered in mist, um, and they encountered a creature called a Mistwalker, um, which you can find as one of the um, many wondrous creatures in the Scarlands creature collection for 5e, uh, which adds a whole plethora of creatures. Um, with a with a Scarlands twist uh, to to the five E game, um, there's there's a really rich and deep background to the entire setting for Scarlands, and uh, all of the lore of each of the creatures builds upon that really, and then weaves them into the setting. Um, so the Mistwalker, um, as as we mentioned earlier, could have gone either way really like you know she she was there to uh try and talk to the group which they did engage with her and they eventually um laid her her kind of what left was left of her physical form to rest which allowed her spiritual form to be released um and upon that moment nevin had a a, a second flashback having already previously <laughs> experienced one over at leone um of a scene of himself uh, seemingly assaulting the docks of Mithril, or um, landing at the docks of Mithril in, in, in some sort of assault pattern with, uh, with other crews. Um, moving on from that, we eventually arrived at the, um, the Elven Outpost, which is at the end of the creek. Which kind of as far as as far up the river as the uh, the group could travel by boat. Um, so they were introduced to Zolara and Abisol, who are the um, the couple who I guess um, organise the outpost, if not if not lead it. Um, and it's a very communal affair, as you experienced, wide open spaces, um, the trees kind of shaped into uh, living areas shared living areas as well um, and that's where we left it really you just you just really arrived at um, at the trading outpost in Clarity Creek Monkey dokey. is there anything that you wanted to add to that sorry Alex 
Um, no, I think that's everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping if I don't bring up the catapult into the tree incident, it's not going to be canon, so therefore it's going to be fine. But I've mentioned it now, but it's fine because no one else is here, so no one will ever know. Um, uh, moving <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, moving swiftly on. Um, <laughs> so Alex, um, Alex's character, Nevin, is a um, Hollow Legionnaire who hail from a... Um, a place called the Gleaming Spire. So, um, the Hollow Knights were created by Corian, who is a um, the, the the kind of lawful good god of the setting, the the uh, god of the paladins and justice. Um, uh, we mentioned Mithril previously because he's also kind of like the uh, Mithril was a city run uh, and organized by paladins and the clergy of of Corian. Um, so, although um, Hollow Legionnaires don't specifically follow gods, they, they, they are largely influenced by the Hollow Knights who, who helped create them. Um, and Hollow Legionnaires are spirits, or the spirits of people that have died um, with some sort of task unfulfilled, um, or a, you know, a strength of faith that has kept them um, lingering in the world. So the Hollow Knights uh, help really kind of repatriate those spirits, um, forge them into help w with mission, help forge them into um, kind of living suit of armor, really, like an ethereal body, uh, conjoined and, and wrapped around a or, or held together by a suit of armor. So uh, almost like a living substance, like a, a living suit of armor. Yeah. It's also the third most metal thing I think I've ever heard in D and D. They're a very unique species. Um, you'll find those in the Scarred Lands Player Guide for Five E, mm -hmm. uh, amongst many many other options, um, all with a Scarred Lands flavour again. Um, and when we were sitting down for our session zero, uh, which is up on our YouTube actually. Um, which is uh, Red Scar Publishing over on YouTube. You'll see us, you, you kind of see a reel of uh, Session Zero where we got together before the stream, um, discussed which characters we wanted to play, um, talked about a kind of brief background and how we might be able to fit them into uh, the campaign and, and the, the group in general. Um, Alex and myself agreed that we'd lo leave Nevin's. Um, background and memories extremely loose um, and build upon them and play really with, with the agreement of each other so uh, you yeah. know, Alex could throw something in of, of flashbacks himself or I might offer some if, if Alex agrees to them um, which is which is part and parcel of the two scenes that I've occurred so far yeah, um, yeah so tonight we've decided to delve into one of, uh, one of those memories a bit more really Normally we play through the Dead Man's Rust campaign, um, which is what we've been playing through so far, which is available on Backer Kit if you miss the Kickstarter. Yeah. Yeah, and it's um, a level 1 send campaign, absolutely epic in scope, really. Um, yeah. Despite There's stuff in there to take you beyond level 10. Yeah, the, the stuff that can take you sideways. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know, I've added a few bits in myself. Um, um, well, I think which is which is given for any game really. You know they, they should kind of evolve and grow naturally with, with player input and um, yeah. everybody working together to, to kind of see the story through. Um, yeah. But there is so much information in the campaign guide um, to run numerous side plots. Um, you could you could run several games in and around the main game if you had a main campaign of players. Um, just, just kind of contending with the side plots, which, which is amazing, and uh, more than enough information to continue the game beyond level ten. Um, but we digress greatly. <laughs> so, what mean you talk endlessly about scarred lands? Never. <laughs> in general. <laughs> yeah, no, we just. We do just have the three hours, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Efficiently. <laughs> 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 but 
but we've got access to a map this time, so we can point and go and where the map there. Um, but anyway, come on, hit me with hit me with my flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's kind of kind of build it into the narrative really. I didn't want to just like yep. in and say you're there. Um, yeah, sure. So you've landed at um, the the trading outpost in Clarity Creek. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I will give Vivan a short, sharp list of instructions because these are elves of particular persuasion, and she is of a background of, or would appear to be of a background of a people that have a sordid history with the elves. Being a um, Titan spawn. Yeah. Um, Tasha Alar is the name of the, the outpost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we've mentioned previously in previous episodes the kind of epic war between the the, the um, near said Titanic forces of the Titans, which doesn't quite sound right, I guess. The um, elemental forces of the Titans, which are these huge uh, entities that that could literally reshape the surface of Sky itself, and their um, their children, the gods, um, who it kind of naturally evolved into war because the titans would reshape the world and wipe out civilizations which would affect um, the, the gods own uh, beings really on you know losing thousands of followers um, on a whim of a titan um, would certainly tear up anyone's soul I think um, so they had no they felt they had no choice but to go to war with their parents um, they could kill the titans so they um, kind of either disperse their essence or um, imprison them uh, but during the war the, the gods didn't didn't fight alone they took mortals to battle with them um, and the other side of that the titans took their own um, their own races in or their own species into um, into battle with them um, and those that kind of sided with the titans whether by choice or um, or a necessity um, were labelled with the moniker Titan Spawn. Um, so there's a bit of a movement to uh, change um, some of the species, um, such as orcs, or, or a certain tribe of the orcs, um, are looking to change their um, other other races' outlooks on them, um, which includes the Sathi, which is Nevin's kind of species, um, like lizard folk. Uh, generally considered to be followers of Mormo from back in the previous decade. Um, and it, it, yeah, so um, still some prejudice around, and uh, you know, yeah. Vivian is is making great strides to um, change people's perception. I think. Certainly, we're describing Vivian. <laughs> Um, so you've arrived at Tasha Alar. The mm -hmm. it's, it's rather late in the day. Um, yeah. Uh, and the dwarves um, unload their trebuchet. <laughs> uh, they seem to have, for what, whatever reason. Um, so this is this is beside Tradoki, who's you know, who's mm. your. Um, Uh, who you're escorting anyway? Yeah. Um, they seem to have kind of unofficially assumed that they're travelling with you the uh, the whole way to uh, Tradoki's home. Okay. Um, I don't know what Nevin has to say about that. But... I think that's in Nevin's head. That's under the um, subtitle of kind of Vivan and. <laughs> walking concerns and it just gets longer and longer it's just if i intervene now she won't learn so i won't intervene until i have to <laughs> also hopefully that means that on the rest of the trip david can fix the really minute parts of the um trebuchet that are, although the trebuchet works there's it working and there's it being up to spec and <laughs> It's bound to be something, whether it's the way that the rope is coiled, 
a bit against the grain of the rope. That's wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, they start to unload it from Bro, and then they they kind of eye the woodland around them, this wild, untamed expanse of uh, of ginormous forest. Hmm. And they look a bit more than a bit perturbed. Um, there's lots of grumbling, um, and they eventually kind of are forced to admit, really, that. It's going to be a bit impractical to try and drag that thing through uh, through the Ganges with with the best will in the world. Um, even you know they couldn't even rely on the stubbornness of their donkey to uh, to make it happen. Um, so there's a bit of a, a bit of a sad moment really where they where they resign themselves to the fact that they're going to have to uh, to leave it either at Tasha Alaa. Um, mm-hmm. Or they have a they have a Bit of a chat with Captain Harmon, mm-hmm. um, and there's a deal struck relief. Captain Harmon's quite happy to, um, especially has as he can maneuver it up and from blow deck. Um, yeah, he's quite happy to keep it on board and offer you all um, free passage on the clear water, should you ever need his services in the future. Oh, fantastic! Um, which Vivian looks rather smugly in your direction at with a uh, with a toothy grin. <laughs> <laughs> Just internally, it's don't be smug, don't be smug, don't be smug, don't be smug, don't be smug. <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. That is beneficial if we have to travel back. If we should. You say toothy smile in my head. Vivian's also doing hand gestures of just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Told you so. Yeah. <laughs> See, helping people helps. <laughs> I don't recall saying not to help. <laughs> Did you find that in the rule book? <laughs> I can't Which one? What, what was her name? For the, uh, what was Vivian's name for the Legion's um, Legion's rule book that she refers to? I think she's given it a name, which isn't the name of it. <laughs> yeah. I think it was referred to as like the Legionnaire's Handbook or Commandments of the Legion. Yeah. Um, I think it's definitely, it had that originally, but several more cruel names have been scrolled on it in the <laughs> years since. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you can, everything's taken off of the boat. Dranoki has what he's carrying on his back, really. Um, the other two dwarves uh, bring a couple of mu- uh, laden mules off of the, off of the boat. Um, Mm-hmm. You are. You've already been into, um, into the outpost, um, so you kind of headed back to the boat, unloaded, heading back into the outpost. Um, yeah. The uh, the wood elves are curious. Um, Captain Harmon's obviously putting a good word for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zalara and Abyssal uh, have, have received you really well. Mm-hmm. They've um, they've agreed to give you all a, a token for passage through the Ganges on um, on Captain Harmon's word, basically, um, mm-hmm. which was really reinforced by the uh, the trebuchet being donated to the boat. Um, so so they explain that the elves um, of Viratri, which uh, is the capital of the Wood Elves in the Ganges, mm-hmm. patrol frequently throughout the whole of the forest. Um, it's likely. That if you encounter anybody, any of them, they will want they will they will have wanted themselves to be seen. Um, mm-hmm. But the the tokens will keep you safe from um, any any unfortunate accidents. They they uh, describe it as. <laughs> um, we're lost in the Ganges all the time. They explain. Um, I'm sure. Mm. We'll just have to keep a mind out for the fortunate accidents. <laughs> Oh yes, well, as long as you, as long as you stick to the uh, known trails, the obvious trails, um, and really don't try to um, dig into anything that isn't of your own affair, then then you should be fine. Unless you're invited to, of course. Okay. 
I think Nevin feels his ears burning from the lasers that are dove with size behind him of shenanigans, secrets, but I would want to put words in Terry's mouth. Um, the, um, quite, we are, we are just travelling through. Yeah. I mean, no interest. The wood elves are kind of buzzing um, about Dovis' presence. Um, it's mm-hmm. not often that they receive one of their cousins from Deirdre and Darlin in, um, in the Ganges. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have a fairly uh, fairly neutral relationship, I guess, uh, which mm-hmm. is certainly better than the hostile one between the Uruk Torn Dwarves and uh, the Drandali. Um So yeah, Do- Dovith's kind of re- received um, rather warmly, really. Um, they try and apply uh, him questions about how things are back in Drandali, which Dovith's naturally um, coy about. Mm. Being left under a cloud, uh, mm-hmm. but they, they seem to be quite happy to uh, have one of their cousins in, in town, definitely in town yeah. at the outpost. Nevin braces himself for the story of when we leave this outpost about how Dovith acquired all of this coin and all of these favours <laughs> <laughs> from the one night that we spent there. Um... Well, yeah, I mean he's, he's Trendali, not Kendo, I guess. But... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but eventually, it kind of like drifts in. Um, the uh, Zalara and Navasal um, invite you to dine with them for the night. Um, enjoy the hospitality. Uh, I kind of recommend leaving at first light, really. Um, or you, you're welcome to stay for a night or two if you'd prefer. Um, they're not expecting any other traders in at any any point, although people do wander in. And out um, without their knowledge occasionally um, to trade wares. We um, would not want to impose, we will leave at first light. Excellent. Um, the evening kind of drifts into a bit of merriment. The, uh, the Wood Elves prod Dovith into a. Um, into um, a song of um, from their home, from his homeland. Mm-hmm. From under the Kelder Mountains. Mm-hmm. Um, Trendali also uh, steps forth and um, tells an epic tale, really, of um, of the elves' great battle to save the um, save the forest from Morm- the assault of Mormo um, mm-hmm. and the sacrifice that were made to make that happen mm-hmm. during the Titans' War. And then everybody kind of drifts into um, to rest and sleep after some uh, some wine is drunk under the um, the edge of the outpost. Yeah. Are kind of in a cloud, so you can see the the sky canopy above you, the stars twinkling away. Mm-hmm. Okay. So a... once I've checked that Picandra and Vivan have. Again, happened to fall over somewhere that's in the shade <laughs> and is appropriately packed down. Um, Nevin will probably. Uh, he'll probably start walking until he finds the perimeter of the outpost rather than ask, just through walking through and then start walking around it just out of habit once of course all the kits have been thoroughly cleaned again because it's been a day on the road and now we're in civilization although it was probably all cleaned before dinner because he's that kind of legionnaire um, and occasionally there's just a momentarily gaze up at the sky a memory of the flashback to the life that wasn't his the drowning the um shadowy figures, the one figure in particular with the silver hair and the sh- shadow arm mm. that he saw. And then the um, sympathetic response of whilst he was at the bottom of that river, then drinking down a considerable amount of it. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly takes you back into that moment. It's a, it was a, you know, the kind of momentous emotions that you felt aside during that moment. Um, yeah. It it's a rare thing to to recall any memory, let alone memory such vivid, so vividly, um, mm. and all of the previous emotions that were attached to that. So 
yeah, you recall it again very, very vividly. Yeah, which then I think, as he continues walking around, makes him think about the other memory that came to him that he's fairly sure might have been one of his in you know, a past life, and how he experiences that one so much so differently. Um, the bits that he remembers are different. He can remember the sound of the river in the first memory, the one that isn't his, um, but he can't smell anything. Whereas when he was storming out of a boat, he could smell the sweat, the blood, the sand, the stone, that coppery tinge, but the noise was, it was softened. It was more of a blur of... Um, almost like a disquiet orchestra tuning up rather than distinct sounds. Yeah. Um, you, you occasionally pass as you're kind of walking around and, and live, really living these memories. Mm -hmm. uh, you occasionally kind of pulled out your very a wood elf either steps from um, steps from behind a trunk or you hear the rustle of a um, leaves above you um, mm -hmm. and you glance up to see an elf keep it and you know, clearly they're making their presence known um, yeah. and they're uh, they seem to be um, rather glad that you're you know you're kind of out and about patrolling um, even mm -hmm. if in their in their estimation I guess somewhat unnecessarily they're, they're happy to have yeah. your presence around yeah I'm showing that I'm willing to pull my weight, given that we're hard, being hard at that. Yeah. Rather than turning up, drinking their wine and passing out. Um. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, as you're strolling around, Zalara um, uh, finds you along one of the routeways between the, um, the, many com or the few communal areas in the outpost. Mm -hmm. uh, she says, uh, do, you, "Do you seem as restless as um, the others of your kind that I met? I've met." Mm. Um. When one has no need of rest. Uh, one must find ways of expending the energy more efficient, uh, more helpfully. Time is something one rarely gets back, so it's best to spend it as fruitfully as you can. Oh, indeed. I don't know who you are or what you are in your former life, but um, as as someone who is long lived. Um, especially living along beside so many other people that are short-lived um, and burn rather brightly in their, in their short time um, and sadly burn out too quickly. Um, it's, it's hard to appreciate that every day is precious in our long lives. Um, I couldn't imagine you know, going from your previous existence to, to one where I guess really time is almost without meaning. Life is precious and to have a new one and the opportunity to fill it how I choose is a gift worth hanging on to at every opportunity. Life is very precious, which is, um, you know, why us what else? really harbour such love for the Ganges um, and the bounties it provides. Um, there are too few places like it after the war. Mm. Well, being so close to the Hauntor Forest, which is you know, horribly twisted beyond recognition, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and having the um, having Deneth the Earth, Deneth the Earth Mother um, so close to our hearts, um, we're, we're thankful and grateful indeed. 
is there anything I can uh, can help you with? Uh, you have done more than enough to help us. Um, uh, so respite is all we need. Although I do have a question of. Um, Well, I have two questions relating to the Ganges and its more recent history. In our travels, maybe two nights ago now, we came across a group of roaming undead down the river. Mm. Are such incursions common? Um, I would not say common. The, I mean, the whole of Skarn really um, is is wreathed in magical essence to a greater and lesser degree. Some still held over from the Divine War. Uh, others just kind of coalesces into pockets. Um, occasionally, then yes, it's unfortunately, creatures from ancient battles uh, drag themselves back into some semblance of life. And we exterminate them where they can, where we, we, we find them. Um, it's certainly not common for them to be wandering the Ganges. Hmm. This was uh, my concern, but I thought I should raise it with you. My second question relates to a entity that we encountered on the river. She referred to herself as a banshee or a ghost. And I'll take out the, uh, is it a, was it a locket? that we got from her. Yeah, she gave you a, um, a locket or a medallion, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah um, with a name that isn't on my sheet for some reason. Um, Kiara Moonshadow? Kiara Moonshadow. Moonglow, that was it. Um, she, mo she managed to um, remember her name, Moonglow, um, when we put her to rest. And she shared a memory with me uh, uh, one of her demise of a silver haired figure with an arm made of shadow hmm. well the symbol I can tell you is um, a symbol of the vigilance of Vesh uh, the medallion and it, it certainly holds uh, some fairly powerful magic would you be able to tell me what kind of magic? I'm not skilled in such arts. I'm trained to use magic, not to understand it. I certainly can. If you'll give me the night with this brooch, then I can return it to you in the morning. Certainly. Um, and even help yourself, hopefully, access the magic. If you're not leaving straight away, that is. I will make the time. Um, uh, the Vigilance of Esh are are a force for good in the world. Um, the um, Vesh itself is a is a fairly fairly stable nation, um, trying to kind of stem back the either the chaos that's ensued in the uh, Divine Wars wake, or or fight back, um, hold back the the. Uh, Conquering forces of the uh, the Black Dragon Vaduk down in Calastia, who um, who you've heard, well, the the name strikes a chord with with Nevin. Um, okay. I've heard it in briefings or yeah. something deeper. Um, yeah. So it's but it strikes a chord both types of, uh, uh, an ancient an old memory. Um, but mm. Also, yeah, you've certainly heard it in. And you've had that feeling before in, in briefings where you've heard the names kind of like, almost like you want to scratch an itch, but you can't quite reach. Yeah. Um, yeah, so King Vuduk, um, uh, swap to the map, I guess. Okay. Who's doing? Oh, it's gone to sleep. Come back to us for a moment until it wakes up. Who's <laughs> doing? Okay. So, what was the name, sorry? The Black Dragon of... Um, King Vodok, the Black Dragon of Calistia. 
Okay. And to remind me, Calastia is south of us? Calastia is southeast of you at the moment. Uh, it's kind okay. of right in the bottom southeast corner of Gelsbad. Oh, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. We're a well oiled machine here. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So the vigilants are currently fighting back. Um, and on, on lots of different fronts, really. Um, yeah. They've got their own, their own problems inside of Vesh with. Um, various other creatures slivering from tunnels and mm. um, hags living in marshes and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly Vaduk uh, has made himself or made his presence known really across the whole of Gelsbad um, as he's trying to expand his empire mm. um, rather successfully as well. It's still not awake. It's getting there. It goes slower when I look at it. <laughs> it knows. Um, okay, so he's been spreading down, spreading his empire out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and as I think, as Dovif explained last week, um, mm -hmm. you know that this particular symbol, the um, of of this medallion uh, mm -hmm. is attached to the um, vigilance of Vesh, mm -hmm. the conifer leaf. Okay. Are they? No, I take it they're known to operate in this area. Uh, no, they're known to. Um, they are a, a, a kind of outpost of vigilance, really, that reside in Mithril to support the, the city of Mithril. Yeah. Um, they, they've got a mutual alliance, really, to support each other. And this particular vigilant lives um, and works alongside the paladins of Mithril to, mm. with scouting and keeping the, um, the plains of Leeds safe, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's... Um, Mithril is, is uh, a long, long way from uh, from yourselves. Yes, which would track with the vision that I had. I got the impression that she was moving clandestinely. Was uh, you picked up in the? Vision dream that she was an elf as well, didn't you? I think I described her as an elf. Yes. Yeah. Um, as for the shadowy silverhead figure, which you provide an excellent description for, mm. um, she really is not sure. Um, are you mentioning your own kind of vision of uh, Mithril at all? Or? Uh, when Mithril kind of comes up in conversation, because Nevin probably. He's raffled enough by the fact that he had a vision of someone else's life that the fact that that then sparked something semi-familiar is enough for him to then lead into that in case it might in some magical hand wavy way be connected. Yeah. She does, she does kind of ponder all of the information together mm -hmm. um, while, she's, while she's kind of um, playing with the medallion in, in her fingers and hand. Mm -hmm. um, and she's she's like you know I'm I'm a great believer in serendipity really. Um, so many connections that that really lead back to one place. Um, 
I'd I don't know, I'd make a guess at saying whoever this sinister figure is is connected to this place also. Um, <clears throat> particularly if your own memories take you there and it connects to Kiara. Uh, perhaps you knew Kiara from a, your past life and that's maybe in a roundabout way what brought you back to, to her location, um, whether you believe that or not. Um, the the events that brought you here may seem structured for the uh, for the gleam inspires kind of um, inception really to to get you on onto the, the task that you're on but um hmm. but perhaps your past life and your current life were always meant to bring you to these moments. Perhaps. So, apologies. You mentioned others of my kinds you've met. Have you met any recently? Yeah. So that's why I mentioned it. Really, a month or two ago, we met a um, a female Hollow Legionnaire named Ravana, um, mm. traveling in the company of other Hollow Legionnaires. Uh, they were really on. On a kind of diplomatic mission from the Gleam Spire, really, to to um, you know make make friends, I guess, for the Gleam Spire, solve problems, um, and they were also also um, looking to head south into the Broadreach Horizon. Mm. Similar situation as yourself, really. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, not having any um, or any experience or, or memory of her of her previous life. Um, which she was quite happy to sit down and talk to myself about. Um. And I did help her to to unlock uh, one or two memories, if that's, you know, free meditation, if that's something that you would like to explore. It would seem... It would seem the flow of the fates would have led me here for a reason, as you say, so it would be ill-advised of me to not seek out as much information as I can. And I can't leave it half a step, and then I go, which is a long way of saying yes. <laughs> that is um, very courageous of you. So, I mean, let's, let's head back to the fire. Um, I can talk you into a uh, a trance, hopefully, with some of our um, some of our uh, kind of innate magic that permeates the um, the forest here, mm -hmm. um, and guide you into the memory um, to hopefully take you further or spark a new memory. Very well. Um, so she actually takes your hand if you're willing to let her. Yeah, in that kind of begrudging way of <laughs> don't rock the boat. Yeah. But, um, there's definitely still a rigidity to uh, his posture. Yeah, and she, she acknowledges that. So um, she, yeah. she kind of gives you a, a gentle smile um, mm -hmm. and and doesn't pull you, but just kind of walks with you back to the, the central communal area um, mm -hmm. where Pacandra's child tightly into a ball, tightly into a ball. Um, Vivin is um, sprawled out across the remains of her rock, <laughs> very close to the fire, soaking up the, uh, the warmth. 20 seconds later, what's remains of the rock? The pebble, the single, yeah. bestowed in her shoe. That made me think of this campaign, what remains of the rock by the end? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you all take yeah, 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 Mike, like we get it, we're all dead, but what about the rock? How much is left? <laughs> um, and Dovith's kind of off in a shadowy corner, cradling some of the uh, the wine, the mushroom wine from here. Mm -hmm. Has he gained another hat, or does he have more war paint kind of pasted across his face yet, or has it been a quiet night? <laughs> He, he has accepted a um, like a world tattoo from the um, <laughs> from the elves, yeah. Um, it means um, muse in the old time. Are you sure? Um, well, I'd imagine like Dover was a thumbs up to his own society. Didn't didn't accept any Drendali tattoos, um, just for the views. Mm. Uh, Drendali are renowned for uh, magical tattoos and and the um, the kind of stunning tattoos that they do produce. Yeah. Um, from their, their kind of silvery inks, um, whereas the elves, the wood elves here, are uh, very more um, uh, tribalistic with their tattoos and you know the kind of world paints and pigments and that kind of thing. So yeah, I'd imagine yeah. him kind of as a thumbs up to his his homeland. Yeah, I'll accept a world tattoo for now. <laughs> if I can take a photo selfie and send it home. Yeah. <laughs> take a wood carving, attach it to a pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> Your mum and dad. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the, the way, surface I'm... and I'm living my best life and it's not a phase. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, I married a uh, dwarf from Burroughs one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, she she guides you back to the fire and sits you down. At which yeah. point she takes both your hands um, mm -hmm. and she, she says, you know, like, close your eyes. Um, mm -hmm. She slips into... Her... Her tone becomes very quiet and soothing, um, mm -hmm. even more soothing than it was. Um, and you hear the murmurings of magic um, as she's talking in amongst that as well. Mm -hmm. And she does talk you back into... You've been holding on to that memory a, a good chunk of the night anyway, kind of examine it from different views and through yeah. motion. So it's very mm -hmm. easy to, to slip back into that um, sense of anticipation and fear as you're in that... The, the whole of that um, what seems to be an assault boat really um, mm -hmm. with with other troops around you um, and it's at this point that you you take a good moment to actually uh, look around at your fellow um, soldiers around you both mm -hmm. both male and female um, uh, you can see that they um they are wearing, um, some are wearing kind of what you'd take to be city guard uniform, um, you know, more like a militia, um, mm. leathers and chain mail, but it's, it's still um, still uniform rather than um, just haphazard piece of armour they've thrown on. Um, but yourself and a few others um, that, that feel familiar to you uh, are wearing sets of plate um, and you can see um, Corianic heraldry over them, so the the kind of four pointing star of um say four pointing star. So Corian symbol is um four blades that kind of inter interpose with the circle around. Uh -huh. Um I need to get all these images prepped up in up into foundry. <laughs> um so your your kind of connection to Corian is, is affirmed um and whereas before you you weren't sure whether you were part of the assault on Mithril or, or um, you know some other reason it feels you, you you feel like you're on a sort of relief mission maybe mm -hmm. um, and with that the a um, somebody kind of thumps down the steps into the hold um, mm -hmm. with with helm tucked under arm um, a rather heroic looking um, you recognize the symbol of the the um, Knights of Mithril Mm -hmm. um, and you um, you recall a name at that Dutorius mm -hmm. um, Dutorius okay he's um, he's a rather you know grizzled um, chiseled jawed shaven uh, guy in in an ornate suit of of, uh, of Mithril armor. Mm -hmm. 
um, and he kind of proceeds to talk to all of you, really. Mm-hmm. Fellow, uh, fellow soldiers, we are heading to the relief of Mithril. They have been under assault for a day or two from the, uh, the hordes dragging themselves free of the Blood Sea. We travel from Hedrada at, um, at our God's calling to, to free our homeland of this incursion. We land on the jetties of Mithril and we fight towards the golem itself. Let us free the city of the scourge of Titan Spawn. Let us send them back frothing into the seas with their tails between their legs. And he lifts his uh, mithril sword aloft and he's like, Forkorian! Forkorian! <clears throat> We're mere moments away. On deck with you all. The archers will protect us. Mm-hmm. And he thunders oh, the red light greens! Yeah. <laughs> Are you mean? <laughs> Are you green? <laughs> So um, it goes back to that part of the flashback where you can see um, you head back up. You um, you're on the top of the boat. The gunwales are uh, um, covered in shields and um, kind of protective measures. Um, there's no there's no kind of slowing down to uh, to ease into the jetty. You kind of like you just thunder into the docks. Really, um, there are there are you can see. Um, almost like floating islands of trash and debris Mm. that have clogged up the jetties. Um, And then amongst that, you can see uh, these rat-like humanoid creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, Some some are kind of, uh, and you recognise them as Slytherin, which are the the, the rat kin of um, the rat folk of um, the Scarred Lands. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of them are kind of deftly slithering in and out and moving amongst these piles of trash. Others are gathered up on the docks. They're carrying huge uh, two-handed axes. Um, mm. And then behind them, you can see the odd... Um, the odd Ratkin... Ha- uh, the odd Slytherin hand- uh, standing back, um, either dressed in robes or wearing some sort of item that gives them away as perhaps a... Um, you know, stood ready with a wand or a staff mm. and um, various enchantments going off. You can see parts of Mithril as it rises up the slope... Um, are ablaze, um, and the the, sh- the ship you're on just thunders into um, some of the trash um, and slams into the jetty with a great cracking and grinding. Um, and with that, Teutonius is attack, all hands attack, um, and even the crew leap off really. Mm. Um, with with Teutonius at the head, kind of slashing through, um, you know, taking blows on his shield. Slashing through his mithril sword, um, which which takes two or three Slytherin out in in one swipe, um, and he's off leading the assault. Cool. I charge in that direction yeah. and thoroughly ruin the day of anyone that tries to stop me. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so you've actually crashed into one of the. Um, you can see there are stone jetties around you, but they pile mm. into a, uh, a wooden jetty, um, mm-hmm. which creaked and shifted with the impact of the of the ship um, okay. and you charge into the dock um, uh, and fight your way into the kind of dock side um, Mithril's tiered up through through the cliff face so okay. um, at the bottom you've got the Blood Sea um, where where you've um, impacted And then it kind of rises up and tears up the cliff face to the way you can see the Mithril Golem perched at the top on the very edge of the cliff. Um, and you can even see the odd fire up there. Uh, the the lower kind of quadrants of, of Mithril, the, the dock side, um, the kind of, kind of, although it's a city run by paladins, um, it does have um, a clear kind of class distinction throughout. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's completely overrun with slivering. Um, and you can see other boats either side of you that have thundered into um, various other jetties and docks as well. So they're, they're all pushing to clear off um, clear off sections to push in 
where the, the Slytherin seem to have overrun. Okay. Um, but you can see the ships, although you, um, you're you clearly from or related to Mithril yourself, you can see the ships have the, um, on the sails, they have the icon of um, Hedrada, which is a, um, a city further to the south along the coast. Right. So it's more of a coalition than a... Yeah. You have a feeling that this is home for you. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, you have come from somewhere other than here. Um, and by the indication of the signage on the ships, it looks like that was that other place was Hedrada. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a huge there's a huge push from your, um, the different crews into the um, the dockside streets. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to do in particular? Um, there's probably um, an emphasis on the one the Slytherin that are standing back that I clearly cast as there is just this pure white hot rage of bring it down, bring it down, end it. <laughs> um, and there's probably a few moments of um, this version of who Nevin was breaking ranks just from getting so angry yeah um there's it's not a disciplined it's not a complete breach of discipline but there is just this endless torrent of anger of how dare you be here how dare you step the tread the steps of my city um and um just a general anger at um, the Slither casters where it's a question of he will probably barge through several ones that are probably trying to cut his head off to slake his blade on a caster. Yeah. Because in his mind, that's all that's let you get in here is you've stolen magic from someone else. Yeah, absolutely. That, that kind of... Um... That, yeah, that rage really rides you through. Um, you, you, you were kind of travelling in the wake of um, Jutonius for a bit, um, but you actually, you actually split off and start creating your own wake. So yeah. um, the kind of the smaller death of Slytherin, um, you're taken down with, with each blow, really. Um, and even even the, the, these these bigger, huge, ogre-sized Slytherin that you you know you remember as Fobies. Um, mm you know, one or two passes with those um, and you're you're cutting through those ranks um, and you come across a, uh, a Slytherin caster mm -hmm. who's um, who's decked out in um, in Titan symbology, you can see um, you can see snakes heads woven into, into her robes um, mm -hmm. and um, kind of elemental mountainous shapes as well um, yeah uh, and as you approach, she kind of um, slams the ground, which makes the ground ring and rumble and crack towards you. Mm -hmm. um, am I still sword and shield in this version of Nevin, or am I? Would you like to be? <laughs> um, do you know what? If we're going with he's very angry, I'm going to say it's a great sword or a two hander. It's a yeah. Absolutely. It's a all attack, no defense thing. Yeah. Cool. Um, so she, this uh, caster slams it down the ground, cracks. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Go on, go. Um, if it's kind of feasible, this version of Nevin, which we'll probably just call past Nevin, probably seriously tries to gauge whether or not he can throw this great sword fast enough that before they can cast the next one it's going to impale them and he'll just step on the heads of everyone between him and there to get it back <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is yeah um, so yeah you you steal yourself your um in your anger your ire um mm. almost you feel yourself drawing upon the fires of corian's forge um yeah, the avenger the yeah yeah, he, one of his names is the Avenger, and also he is the uh, the Smith. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you draw upon those those fires of uh, of 
Corin's vengeance and and you know you feel his um, his Smith's forge, um, which which fuels your um, your strength, your divine might, if you will. Um, and you kind of you you leap over the rent and mid leap, you hurl the blade, two handed, um, which which impales the uh, this Slytherin caster. Um, as she's coming back for another pass with a second spell. Mm-hmm. Um, the leap's taking you within range to kind of grab the hilt um, as she's sliding down it to, to the floor. Okay. Um, it'll be foot on the chest, both hands out, and then a swing round to go tip the head off to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Her. Um, you can see the, the kind of red glint in her eyes dim as they become glassy and as her head rolls off um, just to reflect yeah. the fires around her. Um, I'll pick up the head and I'll throw it at the next group of Slytherin. Yep. <laughs> Let yeah. every soul be subject to a higher power, because there is no power but the will of the gods. They uh, they break and run. Yep. Um, and you see Jetonius on the far side gives you a, a salute with a sword. Mm-hmm. Um, Return it. With that, you, you all kind of push further up into the city, um, and you see your assault has bolstered the ranks of the uh, the troops at the mm-hmm. um, the city wall above, which is kind of protecting the the um, upper reaches from from this lower assault. Um, and they they uh, sweep out mm-hmm. from the gates, um, led by a uh, you can see a young paladin. Um, with with a, a kind of beard similar to mine, really, um, uh-huh. with hair rather than no hair. Um, so he has a, a flat crop cut. Yeah, I can um, tell he's important. He's not wearing a helmet. Um. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> the uh, well, as you as you spot him, and uh, do, do mm-hmm. Tony has spot him as well. He's uh, he's like to Barconius, to Barconius. Let's sweep these foul vermin from the streets now. Um, so he's leading you to link up with this this Barconius. Okay. Using so as it's pushing on, if, if past Nevin isn't at the front, there is just a drill sergeant like shouting of all of them. Wash the streets clean with their blood. Not one left. <laughs> so yeah, that that you meet up with Barconius and you all spin really spin on heel and then push back down yeah. through the streets and it's kind of like a um, a blood soaked frenzy really of of forcing these invaders out of um, out of the city, mm-hmm. um, and you find yourself side by side with a uh, a cleric of um, Corian, um, rather than a paladin or, or a mithril knight. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. That probably that probably focuses the rage a bit, so it becomes more of a um, the Avenger is with us. <laughs> strike now, strike all. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, his voice is probably nearly shot at this point, not necessarily because of how long he's been shouting, but the fact that he's just continually angrily shouting rather than necessarily like he should be shouting. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so it's hoarse and sounds like he's been garbling razor blades, but that doesn't stop him. That just means that he's got to put more more volume into it because that's how it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the cleric's right beside you, and he he seems just as vengeful as yourself and just as full of ire. Um, mm-hmm. So there's no I'm um, well aware that most of yourselves as paladins are able to look after your own wounds to a certain degree. Um, yeah, there aren't well, any... definitely a, there's definitely a moment of back to back fighting with the cleric with some cinematic headshots and yeah. other such shenanigans. <laughs> Um, you you break through and um, you break through another ring and, and manage to bring down another uh, magic user between you both as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a slightly harder fight. There was some um, poison wielding Slytherin involved, mm. um, where where the priest actually did make use of their magic um, mm-hmm. to um, to keep yourself in the fight, in particular when he took a horrendous blow that um, 
sent poison coursing through your veins. Um, but as you bring this second magic user low, uh, the, the fight just seems to evaporate from these creatures, um, mm -hmm. and they're either they're either kind of well either brought low as they're diving into the sea, or they make it into the sea and disappear um, in amongst all the flotsam and jetsam. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the priest introduced himself. He's kind of like mm -hmm. well met. The name is Hadron Vindica. Do I remember my name? Do I have a name? Uh, I'm going to give that to you. I think you should be your honour. Okay. Um, oh, right, okay. Name something on the fly. Damn, and I'm, I'm not even the GM. Um, <laughs> um, Corvus of the Order of Mithras. Well, I met Corvus of the Order of Mithras, and such graceful timing for your um, Sally from Hedrada, really. Without that, I don't know how many more days we could have lasted against, or how that wall against these creatures pushing further into Mithril. Well, when we when we heard as he slides the um, great sword back into its sheath, um, how kind you were to invite so many of the Titans spawn. It just seemed unfair to leave them all to you. <laughs> he he laughs heartily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. We need to share a drink after this, but let's go and find out what Borconius uh, has to say in in the wake of our victory. Certainly. Never have the Mithril Knights known such a young and courageous leader. There is a first time for everything. So he leads you back to... You can see Jetonius is uh, talking to Arconius. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at some point, Arconius kind of starts ordering people to set ablaze to the flotsam that's that's arrived. He's like, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunate we're going to lose the uh, the wooden docks and there'll be some damage to the um, the stone keys and lower buildings down here, but we need to, to clear this to make sure it's not used again. Um, or does it set a light and then, then Jutonius kind of spots you nearby and he calls you over with uh, with a newfound friend yeah so uh, I like to think with the plate where it was kind of painted in order colours and perhaps had a tablet or something it's just soaked in various colours of viscous yeah. blood splatter <laughs> red green and every shade between <laughs> yeah <laughs> Um, it's clearly you know, the armies from repair. You can see the rents and dents that you've suffered from um, from the battle mm. throughout. Uh, Jutonius is kind of like Barconius. This is my trusted lieutenant, um, Corvus. He, uh, well, without him, we couldn't certainly have uh, made such progress in the in the assault. And uh, Barconius himself offered, holds out his hand. Um, Good shake. Yeah, um, gives you a yeah. firm, strong shake. He's early, yeah. kind of early twenties at this point. Um, human, human, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, okay. And you know from from that brief flash of memory that I have that the um, you know for such somebody so young in in charge of the Order of the Mithril Knights, he's um, certainly someone who's who's really no, uh, noted. Mm. He's in a prominent position amongst the Paladins of Coria, and the, the Mithril Knights are kind of like the shining order at the pinnacle of the. Mif of the Paladins of Coria. Yeah. Um, and he's he's at the head of that, apparently. So. Yeah. Um, very esteemed personage. Mm. I do not let go of the handshake first. I. <laughs> That's the important part. <laughs> he gives you a grim smile. He says, well, I met Corvus. Um, I would stop the talk and we, you know, at some point we need to toast this victory, but there are other foul dealings afoot which need to be dealt with. Um so forgive me but I need to make make arrangements uh, we don't have time to rest we need to head into the um, head into the undercity There's, there have been some strange strange earthquakes and rumblings which seem to be emanating from below so I need to organise a party to enter the catacombs may I volunteer to enter the catacombs and deal with whatever foul foul sorceries at the dares to hide beneath the mighty city 
He's, he's kind of half turned away, um, but he, he looks back over his shoulder at Jutonius with an eyebrow raise, and Jutonius <laughs> nods. Um, well, with Jutonius' blessing and his recommendation, I'm glad to have you along. I I then I don't turn my head to look at Jutonius, it's just my eyes moving. <laughs> Boss? <laughs> I've said it now. He nods at you. Yeah. Um, What's a shame? I've said it and it's been accepted. Oh, um, <laughs> whatever will we do? Um, I think I get the feeling of like, this isn't the first time I've done this. It's a bit... <laughs> do you us, like, we'll, we'll make sure none of these um, slivering are lurking around in, in the uh, lower buildings here. Uh, we'll do a complete sweep and take care of the fires, Barconius. And then Barconius like, you coming, Hadron? Who, uh, who gives you a a brief smile as well, and you both kind of walk in, in Barconius' wake, mm -hmm. um, where he's heading back up to the, the middle levels. Um, okay. And he, he briefs you as you go along, really. Mm -hmm. um, Mithra itself has been under siege for for some days now. Um, the, the attack came out of nowhere, really. Um, there was an ill wind. Um, and a, a red moon, oddly. Um, and under those kind of ill omens, uh, this this detritus and, and flotsam drifted in, which precedes the assault. Um, they were even helped by uh, some, some of the uh, creatures from below the waters of the Blood Sea. Some of those foul piscians. So it seems like they were working together, but as I said, other um, other events took place in the uh, middle and upper reaches. Um, earthquakes are are priests experiencing um, bad bad omens and bad dreams, to which Hadron nods. And says, "Yeah, there's a blackness, a kind of I don't know how to describe it really, and uh, an inkiness to the uh, the atmosphere, um, almost as if the Piscians themselves have kind of blanketed them through in in their um, squid-like ink." Um, and Barconis is like, you know, my fear is, is it's whatever this assault was, um, has been a, or is a distraction for, for something that's happening further below. Or more recently, it must be purged. Indeed. Um, we'll leave the majority of the troops to, to deal with the, uh, the trouble that's happening above. Um, but for now, we head up to the entrance to the catacombs where... I'm uh, I'm going to gather a small team and we'll enter the catacombs to, to see what we can discover. Um, and he takes you right up into the to the upper city where you're you're kind of honoured and awed really to be as close to the foot of the Mithra Golem as you've you've ever been previously in your life. Mm -hmm. um, as it stands there towering above you. Um, he leads you in to um into the the church of Corian has a, a kind of it's it's a massive church which encompasses um the the kind of spiritual teachings of uh the mithril order um the the church of Corian itself the mithril mm -hmm. um uh he leads you into the church and he meets up with um, a, a, a middle-aged looking man who's um, who's dressed in leathers with a, um, a a green and brown kind of travel stained cloak um, thrown over one shoulder uh, mm -hmm. and you can see the, the brooch that's holding the cloak together is actually um, holding the shape of this conifer leaf right he says ah Lemsies um thanks also for your your help 
in um, dealing with these these this Titan spawn assault. Um, I'm putting a team together to head further into the catacombs to see what we can discover. Um, thanks, you know, thanks for holding off your own scouting mission um, until I can lead it myself. Uh, who would you recommend to to lead us below, or or at least accompany us as a um, as a better set of eyes and ears? He says, "Well, I'll I'll assign." Um, you know, my best scout, um, Kiara, to your team. Um, so I'll have her meet you at the entrance to the catacombs itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Barconius, you know, says indeed. And kind of, kind of at that, the. Um, oh, is there anything you'd like to? Uh... I, I think Corvus's vocal cords being at rest for as long as. <laughs> They have since the start of the assault. It's that thing of when you lose feeling in a limb, but then it comes back, and it's just pain. And it's just <laughs> um, so. Corpus is probably very much um, kind of battle rage is beginning to simmer down to a low level kind of rev. Um, he's gone past the golem, and his superiors are talking, and there's no opportunity to butt himself in. So. <laughs> Standing there, as you have said, yes, sir. Three bags full, sir. Yes. Well, I mean, um, yeah, the leaders, the, you know, kind of Lemsies, um, Barconius, and then and, um, a. Well, it's, it's kind of like the, the, the run of the ages, I guess. You've got young Barconius talking to this middle aged Lemsies, and a, mm. uh, an elderly, or not, or they're not ancient, a human comes out as well. They're all human. Um, mm -hmm. Strides out as well. Um, dressed in priestly robes so he's not dressed in battle armor or anything but he's dressed in priestly robes mm. and um hadron's kind of like oh heads up my boss is here now too um so they they begin talking amongst themselves for a moment so there is a brief moment where you can kind of just either chat with hadron or you know see. yeah i'll we'll probably have the normal chat when the bosses are in the room of just of the standard kind of small talk and the we're probably already reminiscing about the battle we've just been in <laughs> yeah yeah and he says um he said like you know like i say uh, well we'll we'll investigate the catacombs and see what's afoot down there um but you're welcome back to my estate uh once things settle down um, certainly enjoy a, a, a glass of wine and a, and a, and a meal with yourself um, Certainly, I'll look forward to it, or perhaps several well, <laughs> glasses. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a good half an hour or so before you assemble with Barconius at the um, at the entrance to the catacombs. Mm -hmm. um, just trying to find. Emily, Emily Derigesh was the name of the high priest. Okay. Um, you assemble the entrance to the catacombs, which um, Barconius explains is kind of the entrance that they're using, he hopes, will provide some sort of blessing as you enter, um, which will... The entrance will be um, the, the tombs of the previous heads of the Knights of Mithril. Previous mm -hmm. leaders, um, so they're all uh, interred with great honours in, in a um, in the same crypt, um, <laughs> in separate alcoves. Um, but that there, there is access that leads further and, and deeper into um, eight, the ancient catacombs that were um, that have been built where Rose Mithril was kind of grown. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, just just take the. Um, the entrance is kind of an honour and a blessing. Um, mm. Stick together. Do not become separated. They don't know what to expect. Um, they have um, they have his scout. So Kiara has appeared. Um, the the elf with the silvery hair. Um, mm. She has silvery hair herself. No, sorry, she has jet black hair. Um, 
just remember my description from last week. So she has dark hair, <laughs> uh, but silvery eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, she's dressed in similar sort of leathers and cloak, and wearing the same symbol as um, as Lemsey's. Mm-hmm. And um, there's also a um, a young mage there. She has um, uh, jet black hair. Also, she's human. Um, with mm-hmm. green, green eyes. Um, she's named um, Danye Blackburn. Okay. Um, and then there are several other Mithril Knights also. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Barcone, so like we have the faith of Corian to guide us, um, held strongly within our hearts. We have the vigilant to guide us we have Danye to uh, protect us from magical assault and um, the priests to keep our faith unwavering in the darkness let's proceed Uh, and he leads you down the steps into the Darkened catacombs, and he's um, holding his mithril sword aloft. Um, mm-hmm. The glow from that kind of pushes back the darkness as you enter. Nice. Um, so yeah, the, the, none of the knights are carrying torches or um, mm. just relying on their glow, kind of forcing back that darkness and, and heading into all the recesses and alcoves as you as you enter this quiet, um, serene, cold air of the tomb. Mm. And that's kind of, as you enter that darkness in in the glow of the swords, um, that's mm-hmm. one where your vision starts to waver and you slip back and you can feel the presence of um, Zolara's hands and your hands again and the warmth of the fire kind of mm-hmm. penetrates that, that cold sereneness of the tomb. Mm-hmm. And you slip back into um, Tasha Elar and it surrounds. Okay. Um... Nevin pulls one of his hands back, it instinctively goes to the sword on his hip. It comes about a thumb out, and his thumb gets pushed against the blade because pain is real. It's real because I'm here. <clears throat> it just slides back, and probably before his hands kind of even back in view, it's been healed up from his innate paladin abilities that he still doesn't. Well, he's beginning to understand why he's got them. I am Nevin, I am, I am Nevan, Third Shield, Tesseras, Ninth Cohort, 13th Legion. <clears throat> well, that was different. She she lays her hand on your hand. She, she says, mm-hmm. you know, you, you are who you are. Um, yes. Your, your history doesn't define you. No. It's your acts that you achieve now that do. Yes. Uh, I wear the face of another, but their life is done. What I do in my life is my doing. And this ship of this life that I have is in my keeping. Indeed. Which only makes it more painful than the serendipity of events seems cruelly convinced. Well... If I understand mm-hmm. Ravana right, there were there is some calling, some unfinished task that has kept you all bound to this world and allowed you to become part of the Hollow Legion. Um, and while the Hollow Legion does define who you are now um, and provide you with strictures and oaths. And a sense of belonging. Some of you are now is, as you may see, also oh. to your past. Oh, yes, the grand mission that brought us back. It's a story. It's a story that we all get told. It's the story that we all get told. We're all soldiers for a war that's already over. 
that's the great mission that we're back for to fight a war that's already over. Well, perhaps, perhaps not. Either way, you need, you know, you, I truly believe you you know, for a long time, you'll find one. Yeah, indeed, there is that. Yeah. But all I can say to you is that you will find your own path as you already seem to be doing so. Yes. Gilspad is a small place. It is completely. I would be unsurprised if across two lifetimes some people did not cross paths multiple times. In this case, two people and two spirits. Indeed. Well. I should have the same face, but she didn't recognize it, but she didn't know her name, so that's to be understood. I can't say I hope you, I've brought you some solace, Nevin, because it doesn't seem to be the case. But uh... It's information. Information is neither evil nor good. It is simply removing the unknown. And the unknown is a risk that no one should bear if it can be avoided. I thank you for your help, and I apologise for my demeanour, but I'm sure you'll understand if I take my leave. There are no need for apologies. I will spend some time studying your medallion uh, so that I can pass on Many thanks. the knowledge for accessing it. Mm. And, uh, that a question. How long ago was the Siege of Mithras? Would I, would, would I know? You probably don't know offhand. Um, okay. I'll probably, once I've like pounded the pavement for a good few hours, if um, she's still around or not, chanting and things I'll float around the room or, or basically the next morning when I rebeat before I um awaken the party I will ask. Yeah. Because I don't want to ask Dovith because Dovith will then ask why I want to know. Yeah, no, that's a good point actually. And Nevin's as he's kind of pounding the pavement, the main feeling he has is this kind of begrudging realization of how who he was has defined who he is now by the fact that he is different now yeah the great kind of cosmic joke of he went from being someone that you know washed the streets clean in the blood of titan spawn to being this adoptive father of this lost um soul that he's still shepherding out into the world um the you know, scathing that he's gotten from Picandra about, you know, being shy from a fight when in his past life he was throwing his great sword at people. Um, his, um, and even as he's kind of pounding the pavement, he starts to wonder if the reason that he can't stand still, it's not, is it his training or is it because there was so much energy in that last life that had to be consumed with these great speeches and this cockiness. Is it his choice that he's now like this? Or is it, it's the same parts, but the energy is only having different outputs. Yeah. And that really doesn't so much anger him. It just, it just, um, shakes some of the ideas he had of why he is the way he is, especially when he's been called out on the way he is consistently by Vivian in recent days yeah. and other members of the party. Because the one solace in Nevin's mind was, well, I am who I am now, so all this talk of who I was, it's an unknown factor that could come back to bite me, so I should look into it then, but I am who I am now, and there's nothing I can do about that. Yeah. And the idea that he's in some grand loop where he's meeting people from a past life is something that he hadn't not so much he hadn't considered but he'd hoped it would never happen to him because he's probably heard stories of other legionnaires that have gone out into the world which he still has mixed feelings about because the legion is everything the hollow knights brought us back they brought us back for a reason yeah 
and the idea of going out and getting lapped up in what he thinks is like the little things of, oh yeah, but when I died last time, I was actually a baker and I need to get involved in that because this life is just defined by that one because this one doesn't matter, this one's a do-over, which to him of the, no, we aren't new and thing is something that really grinds in the wrong way. Yeah. And the idea that fate or serendipity or the will of um, one of the gods or a titan is pushing him in that direction just really grinds his teeth. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Which he already does because Vivian continues to find ways to cause Nevin to grind his teeth. <laughs> I think lots for Nevin to reflect on there. Um, mm. I think that's kind of naturally brought the uh, stream to an end with with lots of storytelling tonight and zero dice rolling, which is uh, which is good. Yeah, I've I've certainly enjoyed delving into some of Nevin's past. Um, looking forward to see how Nevin links it to the future for himself. Mm. Um, we go and put it with a Terminator problem. Uh, but you need to go left. I go right. Why? On principle. But yeah. the world will end. Yes. But there's no fate. But what? But what I make. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, fate to go left. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you go back in time to stop you, did you always go back into? Oh, just... <laughs> My Speaking of mind mind bending decisions, um, Mage the Awakening. Um, Victorian age is still going on Indiegogo for the next day. If you're watching this live, if you're not watching this live, then it may have gone. But feel free to look at the Indiegogo and look at the very, very shiny cover. I've never played Mage the Ascension, but that cover is really tempting me. And uh, it's going exceedingly well as well, so definitely check it out. Consider supporting if you haven't already. Yep. They're dangerously close to another stretch goal. Mm. <laughs> Um, and uh, with that, consider checking us out at Red Scar Gaming. Uh, Mark mentioned that we did the session zero to this on YouTube. Uh, we are also on Twitter, where we talk about the games that we make and our other streams and other things. Uh, we're also on the Book of Faces. I think we're still on Instagram. And uh, we're also on Twitch, where we do regular interviews with members of the RPG community. Up on our video on demands at the moment, we have got the one and only B. Dave Walters. Um, talking about many things, and I might have mentioned Yellow by Night once or twice, or three times, maybe a few more. <laughs> it's fine. And next month, we've got Liz coming on to talk about uh, Bluebeard's Brides and the Avatar Legend of Korra RPG, which I'm far too excited about. <laughs> really looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, that's all from ourselves. Um, good night, and thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week, hopefully with um, some of the team back if, if they've recovered and, and um, real world explosions have been dealt with. Um, just, just wish them all the best. Uh, looking forward to catching up with them again soon. Uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>